obviously the the Freddie Chalitsky case it's given a lot of prominence just in the back of the Irish Examiner Tommy Lyons and the lads do great work on the Examiner with with regard to racing um, and the Freddie Chalitsky case um, so he won a high court claim against Graham Gibbons for negligent riding which resulted in a fall uh, that left him with life changing injuries now I, I would argue myself that there's been an awful lot of coverage of the Bryony Foss uh, Robbie Dunn case which was big but this is really really big and it, it's it's obviously a horrific case and because of the paralysis that befell Freddie Tillitsky but this court judgment Richie big big news in racing it is yeah and, and you could go beyond that Johnny and say it's potentially big news in sport mm. um, you know when you have high collision and, and dangerous sports you know whether it's rugby or racing or you know American football whatever you want um, there's always the, the potential for serious injury and you know holding people culpable in that environment when you know everyone is riding to win for example and it's it's a, a, a high pressured environment you know holding people culpable is something that you know hasn't been done um, but it's worth pointing out really that the, the judge in this case Judge Karen Walden Smith has kind of warned against that um, mm. And I'll just read you some of her comments, Johnny, if you want. She said, I, I stress that the threshold for liability of negligence is a high one. The finding does not set a precedent either within horse racing or sport generally. So she has addressed that specifically there. Um, and just further on it, she she was she kind of reported hearing a suggestion that a ruling in favour of Tiliki, this is from Chris Cook's piece in today's race and post, I should add, would make it very difficult for any jockey and indeed any sportsman or woman to be confident that they would be able to compete as hard as they can in order to win for fear that they could be sued if someone suffers an injury. But she rejected that line of thinking, adding for emphasis that this case is a standalone and not the thin end of the wedge. So on the one hand, you know, everyone is kind of scrambling a bit, wondering, you know, what does this mean? And is it going to have serious um, ramifications in terms of all sports bodies gaining insurance and whatnot, um, and whether it sets a dangerous precedent her comments would suggest otherwise and that the case has been taken on its merits. I suppose there are various factors here worth considering. Maybe first of all, on the day it happened, Johnny, the hearing was kind of hastily convened, if you like, because Freddie Tillicki was obviously not in a position to attend. Yeah. And I think Jim Crowley didn't attend either. So you can't have a satisfactory hearing if the relevant people aren't there. So that's on the BHS, George, to some extent. You know, they didn't defer it at the time. Um, and obviously the, the injuries then suffered by Freddie exacerbate the case. But it shouldn't really be that way. Um, you know, the, the injuries, whether you're, whether someone is paralysed or, or tragically killed in an incident like this, shouldn't really matter. The, the bottom line is interference in racing needs to be policed properly, and that is something that hasn't probably happened um, over the last number of years in Ireland or Britain maybe more so in Britain. Um, it's, I think, 12 years since there was a dangerous riding case in Britain, since any rider was found guilty of dangerous riding. Now, we don't know. I mean, obviously, the court didn't rule whether this was a, an incident of careless riding or dangerous riding, because that's not their jurisdiction. They don't kind of, they don't abide by that rule book, if you like. But 12 years without a dangerous riding incident, it doesn't really stack up. The, you know, the, it, there was one actually here in the autumn, and there was one here two years ago. You remember at Cork, uh, at Cork there was one at Ballon Robe in the autumn. Mm. Um, so we've had a couple recently. But the, the fear the whole time is with the authorities is if they find someone guilty of dangerous riding, that they will then be open to these sort of claims. So that kind of then in turn fosters a culture of you know anything goes, um, winning at all costs, as we've discussed frequently before. Um, and that's a pretty dangerous environment. So I must say, am I surprised that this has happened and it has come to this? No. If you know that, that I have to say that I'm not surprised it came to this because it hasn't been policed properly over the last number of years. Yes. Jim Crowley obviously made statements in, in, in the court as well in relation to what um what may or may not have happened that day that are that are very, very important to the case. But you, you rode for many years. What actually happened here from a jockey's perspective? I would love to know to be able to answer that question honestly, Johnny. But mm. it's very hard to get a replay of it. Mm. Um, so I can't. I, what I can tell you is what was reported in that, and 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 they have basically found that Graham Gibbons came across um, Freddie Tillicky's mount and basically caused that horse to fall. That's basically what happened. This is um, as you kind of alluded to earlier. This is something that has been discussed a lot recently, um, and 
it's something that the stewards just bottom line is they need to do better on because the, the jockeys will ride to the rules in each country. If you remember a few years ago in France or a lot of the time in America still and other foreign jurisdictions, the jockeys ride to the rules as they are implemented in that country. And in France previously, before the rules were changed, jockeys kept straight because they knew they had to because if they didn't keep straight, they were going to get thrown out. End of. If you interfered with someone, you went behind them. It doesn't happen in France anymore, and it has never happened in Britain or Ireland, basically. So the jockeys ride accordingly. They'll take the suspension on the chin for, for careless riding. They, once they win the race, they're happy. That is something that has to change, and, and this case might be a, a timely reminder at this stage for the authorities to come down harder on these things. You, you might remember a couple of months ago, Johnny, I did a piece with Edna O'Brien, actually, and he mm. came out very strongly on this, and it wouldn't be kind of, you know, it, for it him. wouldn't be... Yeah, it wouldn't be Eden's kind of way of doing things to, to come out so forcefully. Um, he has obviously, you know, seen his own daughter injured in an incident and he was very strong at the time in relation to the matron stakes that um, Shane Foley rode what he felt was dangerous, uh, dangerously. And I put it to him at the time, I said, well, hang on, Ryan Moore in the champion stakes half an hour later drifted halfway, drifted fully across the track and allowed his mount to do that and carried um, Tarnow with him. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, he said that was careless. I think he said something along the lines of, and, and I'm uh, trying to recollect here. here. I, well, I think he should. I think he said that Ryan should have got ten days for careless, and, and Shane should have got a month for um for dangerous. I might even have it here in front of yeah, me. But even um, even on that, like that 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 would be like completely out of out of kilter with what happens. Even if, for him to say Ryan should have gotten ten days yeah. would have been massive. And obviously yeah. Shane effectively saying he rolled dangerously or whatever for thirty. Yeah, yeah. What he said was Ryan should have got a week for careless, and Shane should have got a month for dangerous. Mm. It's not rocket science. Mm. Now that's fairly strong talk from a man who and we know is 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 fairly and the, careful with what he says. So the, I mean, the, the, it's it's a sorry, Richie. Yeah, the thing here, the thing here, Shane, is that like you you, you don't you know you 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 have your wide interest in sports, Shane, but you people do not realise the dangers that jockeys um are. This is just on the flat, not even uh, riding over a fence. If you're riding at forty miles an hour on a relatively hard all weather surface. If you fall and there are fourteen horses around you, you're in big stock here. Yeah, and 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 I guess the point on this, lads, is that the skill of the jockeys has to come into to effect. Like Richie, you mentioned a couple of the quotes from um, uh, from the judge Karen Walden Smith uh, in this particular case, and like one quote that stood out for me when I was when I was reading about this, um, what she was talking about, uh, she said, and Nellie Dean, of course, was was the mount uh, with Freddie Taliki was on board. Uh, and she said in court, if Mr. Givens was not aware of Nellie Dean's presence, he clearly should have been. So clearly in this ruling, Richie, the judge has, has given benefit of the doubt that uh, Graham Givens is an experienced enough jockey uh, and a jockey at that level should be aware of, of the horses around him. Yeah, and it's it's one of the first rules of race riding is you have to be aware of the people and the horses around you because you know if you go out and you ride, you ride without due care and caution for them, accidents will happen and people will get hurt. Um, you go back to um, even, you'll remember as well, Johnny, again, this one will be very familiar to you, the, the very tragic incident at Galway um, many years ago with, with Sean Timmy Hooligan, Hooligan, yeah. Or, yeah, yeah, and, and Timmy Hooligan. Subsequently, Timmy, by all accounts, you know, held himself responsible for, for his role in that and unfortunately um, took his own life subsequently. Mm. Like, that is the ultimate tragedy in, in relation to something like this. You have one man who died as a result of the fall and, and another man who blamed himself for it. Um, I think he had argued that he's up. been almost written out of Irish racing, tragically. Yeah, it's very sad. And and that, that you know, that's an extreme case. But that can happen. Um, and horses can get falls and get hurt and get killed, and jockeys can get falls and get hurt and get killed. So that is the environment within which they operate, and they have to ride accordingly. And anyone who who isn't kind of going out on a daily basis, you know, with that sort of mindset in their head, you know, that they need to. It's not just about winning. It's the, like there is a difference between shutting doors and tactical race riding, and subtly being dangerous, mm. which can happen. So that is something that, as I say, the stewards need to be more proactive on. It's It's been kind of going on long enough and enough of us have been talking about it for long enough now 
um, that they need to start picking up the ball on this and, and doing better on it. Just You mentioned Chris Cook as well. He had a brilliant article on this in conjunction with uh, the, the Brian E. Frost case at the time and the weighing room sort of culture. Um, and I'm going back to the 1st of December here. Jim Crowley tells High Court that Graham Gibbons' breath smelt of alcohol on day of Freddie Tlicky collision. And as Chris wrote about at the time, this this is a very very difficult case because obviously if if, if this were the case and you thought that the, uh, somebody who was riding in a race smelt of alcohol obviously that you you got to you got to react there but the, Chris's point was that there's an amerta maybe in the weighing room that needs to be challenged I don't know what you made of that. Well, there's a whole discussion there about that. I mean, the times have changed and we we all have to accept that. Um, and you know. There was a time when lads used to go out with a stiffener beforehand. Mm. Um, and when I was riding, plenty of lads used to ride like that when they'd have been, you know, had a hairy night the night before. That sort of thing is not acceptable anymore. And that is why we have breath tests and alcohol tests and so on. Um, and yes, I think there, there's, you know, you can look at it now and say, why didn't the senior jockeys intervene? They probably should have. Um, but it's easy to say that now it's, it's hard to walk up to someone on the day um, and tell them they shouldn't be riding or to go into the steward and say, I think he he needs to be breath tested. Um, whereas that that culture obviously hasn't hasn't existed previously, and it's something that needs to um, needs to be looked at. Um, you know, the weighing room culture has obviously come in for a lot of stick lately. Um, I can only speak from my own experience in there. It was always very positive. Um, but when someone has a problem, you know, there needs to be structures in place or there needs to be people they can speak to, whether it's you know, um, a chaplain of some sort or a welfare officer, they need to be able to go to someone. We have to keep up with the times in that respect. Um, there's no doubt about that. When you look at the Brian Lee Frost case, you know, she obviously didn't feel she could speak to anyone or that she wasn't being, being listened to properly. Um, certainly that seems to be the, the insinuation in relation to the PGA. So, I mean, you know, she... <sighs> There was there was a failure there, I suppose, on behalf of senior jockeys, on behalf of the PGA, on behalf of the BHA, that none of them stepped up in time. Now we're you know we're talking about a different case here, so I don't conflate mm-hmm, two, mm-hmm. two cases. But if you're talking about that aspect of the way room, um, there was a lot of failures there that it, that it led to to what it ultimately led to. Uh, Richie, just just a uh, just one on something you mentioned there—the fact that you know it's it's hard to get footage of this race at Kempton from 2016, in which this uh, this terrible incident happened. Um, was that the case in court? Did, I mean, we're talking about a very short space of time here. There's only a, I think it's a four second space of time in which this incident is said to have happened. So uh, clearly, the court were able to come to a judgment regardless. Mm-hmm. But did did they have the footage in, in court, or was it was it? Oh yes, they were going yeah, no, to the best of my knowledge, they did. Yes, and they showed it, and, and it was all kind of gone through. Um, it's I, I'm just not aware of it. It's in the public domain at the moment. A lot of the time, when there's an incident like this, they get taken offline, mm-hmm. um, which you can understand. And when I looked for this previously, I, I couldn't find it. I don't know if you've seen the incident recently, Johnny. No, I, I didn't. Um, personally, I probably wouldn't want to watch it. I did see, I, I actually was looking for it there. I saw one of the tabloids today has a has a still image of um, sort of the incident. And t- to be honest, that's as much as I've seen. Um, I guess with respect, I wasn't um, making a judgment on the case. And with respect to Freddie, I, I simply didn't want to watch that. And I think that's, I guess, Richie, that's the whole point that you're not able to watch. Yeah. Yeah, no, they, they've just, it's the same when, when horses are, are seriously injured or fatally injured, they tend to tend to remove it because it's it's unfortunate and no one really wants to be seeing it. Not And it's not it's not to hide hide these things, but yeah. um, it's just not, it's, it's not comfortable to do. Uh, Freddie and Richie, of course, have something in common. They're former jockeys who have um, gone on to become um, very good in the media. Um, Richie, you will be flat out over the Leopardstown, Limerick, Down Royal, uh, Kempton and all of that going on uh, from the 26th onward. Obviously, Leopardstown, 5,000 people, um, which isn't ideal. It's a lot better than none, though. Um, You must be looking forward to it. Yeah, it's going to be a great few days again, Johnny. It always is. Um, You might have seen Gordon Elliott's comments in the last few days that he's anxious for good safe ground which is a slight concern at Leopardstone this in is recent December, years Richie. So. how nuts is this like and I know, it's not even know, unusual anymore it's it's not no we've had it in December and February for the Dublin Racing Festival um, so hopefully they will have put on plenty of water and we'll get all the good horses that we want to see there um, there's some great racing in store um, you know I'd be I'd be a, 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 always kind of fond of the three mile chasing category and you've got Delta work um, going up there and um, 
and we've obviously got um, Minel Indo, of course, going to Kempton for the King George as well. That should be a cracking race. What so, a King George as well. No Irish winner since Kick and King in, was it 2006? Yeah, he won back to back. It's remarkable. Yeah, it's just one race that we have not had a bounce of the ball. And the tour got chinned in it a few years ago. Don Cossack fell in the same race, three out, two out or three out when he was running a big race. So we just haven't had the bounce of the ball. But given the way things have gone this year, um, you know, the Irish horses are winning everything basically in, in, in terms of the marquee British jump races. So you'd imagine it would be, uh, it, it, you know, it, it's a good opportunity for us to kind of to, to get one in, in that again. And of course, Rachel Blackmore will be doing the steering. Um, she's had a year like no other, you, you know, it's just incredible what she has achieved. And she's getting all the accolades at the moment in the various awards. Um, so it'll be good to see to see um, in Elendo show up well in, in Kempton as well. And the best day of the year to buy the race and post is, of course, Christmas Eve because you get all the cards for the 26th. That's right. And you get Gavin Lynch's column this year as well, John. You know Gavin. No, he's, he's no uh, good. No good. No one about sport. <laughs> he, he, he's a great a great man for looking ahead and, and, and uh, seeing how all these races are going to impact in terms of the Shelton Festival in the months to come. And his column will be in the paper on Friday. Yeah, Gavin is top notch. Um, Christopher Henry on YouTube. Can I get a birthday shout out? You'll make a South Derry lad very happy. Um, and I uh, hope you have a great birthday, Christopher. Richie, we're talking about uh, things that people got into during lockdown. Shane Hannon, you'll be very impressed uh, that Richie went from um, being a bit of a novice to uh, a, a, an open water swimmer. And Richie, this has become a massive part of your life, getting into the open sea. It has, Johnny, yeah, yeah. I don't know why we're talking about me now, Johnny, but yeah, and I'm actually sporting my Clonic Kilty Dolphins shirt, if you can see it, or a hoodie. Is that the yeah, club? No, it's, yeah, no, it's, it's not even a club. It's just a group of us on WhatsApp, and, and it's it's a group that's growing all the time. Um, I swam for 12 months from kind of August to August through the winter, um, just in togs and only kind of, you know, casually swimming for 10, 15, 20 minutes. Um, and I said two or three times a week all winter last year, last winter, and... It got to, when well, it basically got to 12 months, August this year, I kind of wanted to challenge myself a bit and get out of the comfort zone. So I um, I started doing a bit of distance swimming and I fell in with this Clonic Kilty Dolphins crew and they're a great bunch of people, um, you know, and, and we get out kind of most days, even at the moment, um, certainly four or five days a week. It's it's uh, It's been a real challenge and, you know, as you, you say, I would have been very much in beginner mode um, even a few months ago before I joined these guys. And I remember the first time I went out in choppy waters and, um, you know, I came in pretty quick. It, it's, it, 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 I, I wasn't able for it and I wasn't ready for it and I wasn't expecting it. And, you know, in the space of a few months, uh, you know, I was out there yesterday and it was fairly mental out there, but you get comfortable and you learn how to cope in it. Um, and you, you know your technique improves as the more you do, obviously, like anything. So, yeah, it's been uh, it's been it's been it's been great. Um, I've got a great kick out of it, and and looking forward to you know when the when the kind of the long distance swims pick up again in the spring and summer. Looking forward to doing a few more of them. I can only imagine what's in store for you in terms of long distance swims. Richie, thanks a million for your time. Thanks, both.